The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, miles of memories, crash landings, exploding satellites, and mysterious golden nights on dodgy horses. Plus part two of the miniseries adaptation of Eric Flint's Islands. Followed by part 25 of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We continue this time with part two of our two-part interview with Lois McMaster Bujol. Lois discusses her Vorkosigan saga novel, Memory, which has been reissued this month in a nice new trade paperback format, and lots of other matters for Kosigan. The latest Vorkosigan novel, Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance, is now out in mass market paperback as well. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. And Bain Books Audio Drama presents the second installment of our four part audio drama miniseries, Eric Flint's Islands, set in the world of the Belisarius series by Eric Flint and David Drake. This is an entirely original adaptation. It's a show, not an audiobook. We have a full cast of professional actors, an all-original musical soundtrack, and cinema-quality sound effects. But before we get to all that good stuff, here's the news. We have some great free fiction and free nonfiction at the Bain.com website. Up now is Picket Ship by Brad R. Torgerson. This is set in Brad's Chaplain's War universe and features a really gritty tale of survival after a crash landing on a planet controlled by mantis-like aliens who have attacked humanity. Brad's debut novel, Chaplain's War, will be out in October, by the way. Also on the site is the first winner of the all-new Bain Fantasy Adventure Award. This is The Golden Knight from writer K.D. Juliker. I was one of the judges on this contest, and we all thought this was a most excellent story. It's a pretty straightforward epic fantasy adventure, but the characters are great and the plot is very nicely constructed. It's a good story. Finally, we have Living Without Satellites by Les Johnson. Les, as you may know, is a NASA scientist as well as the author of Back to the Moon with Travis S. Taylor and Rescue Mode with Ben Bova. Rescue Mode is now out. In this piece, Les details what a world would be like when satellites fail. It's not a pretty picture. Civilization is built on satellite technology these days much more than we might expect. And satellites themselves are a lot more vulnerable to a catastrophic event than most people realize. It's a great, if somewhat disturbing, piece by Les. So check those out at Bain.com. Right there on the front page, Picket Ship by Brad R. Torgerson, The Golden Knight by K.D. Juliker, and Living Without Satellites by Les Johnson. They're free and they're all great reads. Here is part two of our two-part interview with Lois McMaster Bujold, the creator of the multiple award-winning and internationally best-selling Vorkosigan science fiction saga, Runt, Spy, and Sion of Nobility in a Star-Spanning Empire. Getting back to the emperor, which is where we started this question, why Barrier has an emperor? Um, We've had a couple of civil wars. We've had a couple of changes of regime. And that, uh, at the time, uh, as part of what the story opens, is um, a young uh, six-year-old boy inherits uh, the empire from his grandfather, who is dying of, of old age. And uh, one of my main characters, Errol Borkosigan, is appointed his regent, and so sort of tossed into the into the political uh, mix there, and has to try to try to pull the plan it through um, and bring it, you know, bring it up to speed uh, and protect it and uh, deal with everything, you know, so, uh, so he has quite a job. But then his son, Miles, then becomes the main character of the, the action-adventure stories that we follow uh, as he goes out as an agent of this, this mini-empire. 
The regent's son, that is. And yeah, the regent's son the, at that stage. Actually, he's dad is retired from the regency and into the prime ministership by the time Miles is actually uh, having his galactic adventures. But but that's all. Yeah, that's a detail. You know, that we don't need to trouble the new reader with right away. Very backstory heavy universe after a while. It's got a lot of history, a lot of detail. And uh, whenever I'm writing a new book, one of the big questions is what to leave out. Yeah, how much can I leave out? Does the reader does the reader really need to know this now here, or can we set that off and let them discover it later in another book? It uh, it's a problem that gets worse with every book because there's more backstory and some of it is pertinent. Uh, so. Uh, it's, a, it's a, one of those series things that people who don't write series don't have to worry about. Yeah. Are you ever tempted to uh, to just start dropping a giant expository lump in and get 20,000 words out of it? It's tempting. You know, yeah, what happens, I usually have characters who explain things to each other at too great a length. You know, I have to like, go back and cut down the as-you-know-Bob conversations. Uh, sometimes you can work them in. Uh, one of the uh, one of the good tricks for introducing backstory is uh, the same as when introducing front story. If you're taking the reader to a new setting, is to have a character to whom it is all strange and for whom it needs everything explained, and that, that's a nice smooth way to get uh, to get in a lot of this stuff. I've used that trick several times, uh, variously. Well, you have various people in this book that need a little explanation. Uh... Miles new drive well, memory or, yeah <laughs> memory or in uh, yeah or which one are we talking about now yeah we're losing track uh yeah in memory we have some of that as well you know but we can do yeah you know, we can do the reports you know the, the impatient imperial auditor asks for the precis not the long version mm -hmm. and we get you know we get about what the reader wants to take in so miles is pretty high up in Barry R society uh, and he's uh he's cousin to the emperor i guess mm -hmm. he's got a lot of money guess, yeah, and power accrued to him. family trees that cross too often but... and ivan Borpatrol is his uh is his good friend we this is a book where ivan and miles spend a lot of time together um can you tell us about the relationship between miles and ivan Oh, yeah, the ice water bath. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Ivan once again goes back uh, to one of the early books, The Warrior's Apprentice, and he was started off as many of my ongoing series characters do as a walk-on part. Uh, Simon Ilian started as a walk-on part, you know, way back when. So did Kadelka. Uh, but uh, but he basically I, I brought him in basically to annoy Miles. Uh, Miles had just failed to gain entrance to the military academy to which he aspired, and Ivan had. Uh, succeeded. Uh, so Ivan came by and twitted him about it a little bit. And he was he was a lumpish 17, 18 year old at that point. Uh, obnoxious. Uh, charmingly obnoxious, but obnoxious. Uh, and then he kept popping up as the books came on. Uh, he had a part in uh, Brothers in Arms that was uh, large and important. And uh, he developed. You know, he kept, kept finding more things to do and becoming more interesting as he went along. Uh, you are is what you do is especially true for a fictional character. Characters grow by what they do in the course of their books. So he turned up in uh, turned up in Mirror Dance. He had a little part there to play. Uh, we got to see him a little older. We got to see him getting older and and wiser and not so feckless. Uh, he really did do boneheaded things when he was a kid. You know, the nickname of Ivan, you idiot, was was earned. <laughs> uh, but but he got better. Uh, as, as we all do, hopefully, as we get older. So when we see him at age 30 in memory, he's uh, just been promoted to captain, and he's got a, uh, an important desk job at, in, in the capital, uh, in the uh, military hierarchy. And he is brought in to help wrangle Miles. And uh, later, Miles uh, taps him when he needs somebody he trusts uh, when he's uh, getting into the investigation part of the story. Uh, so Ivan does quite well in this book. He kind of come his, comes into his own here as a more mature uh, character. There are some care, people, readers, who still hold against him his behavior at age 17. <laughs> they can't quite get over that. But uh, but others who, who really, really like him, man, like, like seeing him develop. 
uh, as the series goes on. Yeah, well, they um, the encounter when they're young did develop a friendship, even though he was a, a bit of a, a jerk. Um, he's sort of the anti Miles, isn't he? I mean, he's like really good Pretty looking. Pretty much. <laughs> Tall and handsome, and uh, you know, everything seems, from Miles' point of view, everything seems to come easily to this, him, although he has his own traumatic backstory, as we learn as we go along. Um, it's a, both he and Miles are only children. Um, uh, Ivan's father was uh, killed in the War of Verdarian's Pretendership. His mother never remarried, so he became an only child with a single parent, and Miles had two parents but no siblings. So they became, uh, as they grew up, uh, sort of surrogate brothers to one another, uh, for lack of you know, anyone closer. So they were in the same milieu, dealing with a lot of the same issues. Uh, so that was, you know, they, they grew backstory as, as the uh, series moved forward. So tell us a little bit about Simon Ilian and the and and he's basically the provides the MacGuffin or the uh, the main storyline for the. For the book, what's going on with yeah, for memory, yeah. yeah. Who is he, and what uh, what's his problem? We've gone into it a little bit. Okay, um, yeah. If we're, well, if we're going to limit it to memory here, <laughs> rather than going forward or backward in the timeline, he's been this uh, excellent chief of security uh, for you know for many years here, um, for uh, gosh, almost well thirty years. Um, at the at the point that memory starts, and then he suffers this uh, trip breakdown, of which there is you know, much to say, and it produces Alzheimer's-like symptoms. That uh, uh, basically it floods his mind with crystal sharp memories of the past uh, more and more frequently until he can't tell whether he's living in the now or living in some uh, prior time. Which, if you're chief of MSEC and giving orders to people, isn't something that's a real good idea. He's quickly uh, hauled out of his position and, and stuck in the IMSEC clinic, and Miles has to kind of go rescue him both medically and otherwise. Uh, we never actually see inside his head, but we get, you know, we get the exterior view from Miles, who is, is paying close attention. So um, in the course of the story, the chip eventually gets removed, and he recovers, but he does not recover the kind of photographic memory that he's used to having. So he's basically, from his point of view, being dumped back into ordinary cognition is like being disabled. Um, and uh, plus he has some other you know, neurological issues uh, associated with it. So he's pretty much also uh, tossed out of his job for medical reasons and has to make the adjustment uh, uh, from, uh, from being a, a very high-powered uh, uh, officer to being, you know, medically retired, and now what does he do? Uh, he finds he finds a few things. <laughs> so uh, he, he actually does better than Miles at this, but I think he's closer to that age where you expect those kind of transitions, where Miles was not. Well, he's, I mean, he's very much like this all-knowing master spy master to Miles, um, a mentor figure. Yeah, from Miles's point of view, it looks like that. From Simon's point of view, it's a little more tap dancing, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, certainly Miles thinks the world of him. Uh, but this breakdown is, is uh, I mean, don't want to get too much into the metaphor, but it's very much like you discover your dad is only human and, or something like that. Yeah, there's good. you got to take care of that. Him. Yeah, it's like, it's very scary for Miles because it's like a parent getting sick. You know, all of a sudden the foundation of your world is rocked. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, it was made a very exciting plot that had, didn't have anybody hitting each other. It was, uh, it was fun that way. That one is the one that a lot of people relate to because they've had life experiences that impinge on it one way or another. Uh, mm -hmm. so. Well, so that that really worked as as the center of the the book and the plot and the, the book's themes, which are all about these life transitions. Simon's not a. He's not. Uh, nobility, right? He's not an aristocrat in any way. Correct. Yeah, he's a pro. He's uh, you know came up through. Um, he didn't even go through the academy. He went through some kind of ROTC program, <laughs> Perrier and equivalent, you know, back when, and was uh, an ordinary, if extremely bright officer when he was picked to go, you know, get this chip installed uh, as a you know as a thing that Emperor Azar wanted at the time. 
Uh, and then, you know, then his life spun out from there, and he found himself connected with the Vortosigans. And when that happens to you, your life, you know, suddenly <laughs> goes on steroids. Um, so he's uh, he's developed. Uh, so he has interesting. He's an interesting character because he has a lot of implied backstory, but not a lot of it is is fixed. So people are kind of free to imagine what they like uh, with him, and they do. Yeah. Well, I, I, he's the kind of uh, master spy that is very fun uh, <laughs> in in a lot of espionage <laughs> stories. Popular with the friends. I mean, chief of chief of the secret police is not most people's idea of a romantic hero, but but Elian gets them. You know, he's got his whole fan cadre of women who want to see him do well. <laughs> uh-huh. it's fascinating. Well, speaking of doing well, there's a the the main plot concerns Simon. Uh, there, but there's also some matchmaking going on throughout the novel. There's this uh, strong subplot. Gregor finally falls for uh, Laisa, uh, and she's a very winning character. Can you tell us a bit of her background and uh, and what it means that he he goes for? Her? Uh yeah. There's uh, she's not a Gregor's the emperor. She hasn't had a whole long, whole lot of on stage time. But this uh, so once again, we get into the backstory. Uh, when Barrier was rediscovered, they were uh, invaded through another system, Kamar, by the Cetagandans. And when they threw the Cetagandans off and got their act together, the first thing they wanted to do was nail Kamar and get those wormholes under their control so that they could never be invaded again. And that was Miles' father's big military thing, was the, the conquest or annexation, depending on your political view of, of Kamar. Uh, so the Kamarans have, weren't too happy about this, but they have settled down. And uh, Lisa is a uh, upper-class Kamaran woman. Uh, her family owns a trade fleet, and, and she was on Barrier as uh, as a kind of lobbyist uh, at the time she met Gregor. Uh, so, and Gregor himself comes from this high four background where you know where there's been too much madness and too much craziness and too many people marrying their cousins and. He really, really didn't want to make, marry another four, but everyone is on him because he's the emperor and he's supposed to be producing an heir so they won't have another damn civil war uh, over the uh, succession. So there's a lot riding on that. Uh, and he sees Lisa as pretty much, you know, it's it's perfect. She's, you know, she's smart, she's galactic, she's you know, the kind of future he wants for Barriere, and she's not four. And, and she's also very well built, you know, so there are many, many factors at work here. Um, so, uh, so for him, uh, you know, she's kind of, she kind of is the answer to his prayer. So yeah. good for him. Finally, we got him happy. Yeah. Well, he's um, been avoiding everything that his aunt has tried to set up for him to this point because of the, uh, yeah, yeah. His, uh, his aunt Alice, his Ivan's mother has been his social, uh, secretary and social, um, hostess, official, you know, hostess, uh, diplomatic hostess. All these years, she sort of grew into that job out of, uh, out of her previous adventures in the prayer books. The society on Barriar is pretty patriarchal, but you you have all these women characters who control things from behind the scenes. You know, it's uh, you can only get so many characters on stage at a time. You know, so it's, there's a limit to readers' attention and writers' attention. You know, you know, how much how much can you show? You know, cause if you've got a cast of you know a dozen. Uh, but it, you know, it's, it's kind of throw it in in the background. The idea is things are improving. Um, you can't complain about the women not having to vote when nobody has a vote. Uh, <laughs> so there's sure that. Uh, the women are not in Perda. Uh, they're out. They're active. They're economically active. Uh, they're active in their families. They're active in you know the world of work. Um, so it's just a few a few areas that are closed off to them, uh, which become plot points from time to time. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, back to back to Lady Alice and Simon. So the idea is that Alice and Simon have actually been working together for most of these 30 years since he's chief of security and she's the emperor's hostess. Uh, so they've had to be, you know, um, coordinate on everything, you know, diplomatic functions and, and whatnot. Um, so uh, so it turns out that, uh, you know, when, when he goes down ill, she's extremely upset about it. You know, why didn't anybody tell me? Uh, and uh, from that, a... Uh, a romance that was long laid finally goes into fruition because Simon gets rid of the memory chip and his job, which were sort of 
competing for for all of his attention. Yeah. So uh, allows him to have a personal life finally. There's other there's other personal issues and there's other love stories that are playing out uh, in the book. Especially um, this is when Miles transfers from his Admiral Naismith uh, identity, and he's he's got some girlfriends as Admiral Naismith, who he really has a lot of feeling for. Yeah. Uh, like Ellie Quinn and, then, and several of Naismith, Tara. It averages out. Yeah, he's got several as Naismith and none as Lord Varkosigan, as he realizes at some point. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he has uh, somebody, uh, one of the characters remarked about Miles, the problem isn't that he picks up so many girls, it's that he never puts any down. You know, he tends to, uh, you know, keep ha- trying to have a relationship with every woman that that, uh, that crosses his path in that way. So yeah, he, he gets a, a somewhat embarrassing accumulation at various points. Uh, yeah, so one of one of the issues in this uh, in in memory was he has he has a long time relationship with Commander Ellie Quinn, who's part of his Naismith identity, and also with uh, Sergeant Tara, whose backstory is uh, presented in the novella Labyrinth, which can be found in Borders of Infinity, which is a slightly earlier book in the series. So I won't go into it there, uh, but he has to give them both up if he, you know, once he's nailed back on barrier. So that's, you know, when he gives up the Naismith persona, he's also giving up his love life, uh, as far as he knows, you know, knows it to date, uh, and that's that's a wrench. Well, and Tara is eight feet tall and has fangs. Yeah, well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> and Miles is not the tallest guy in the world. He was, <laughs> She was one of his early rescuees, and how they how they became a, an item there. Uh, she actually predates his affair with Quinn, uh, if you look back. Uh, but they they keep trying to keep to the rules and keep not. You know, it's just non fraternization things. Their rules are there for a reason. Uh, but uh, but they have a, a kind of long standing special relationship uh, because of uh, because of that rescue, because of her particularities, because of yeah, how he found her how he uh, saved her. Uh, and uh, Quinn is, you know, Quinn is all those galactic things that, you know, that he was kind of in love with representing for him. Well, he's not, I mean, with with Quinn, he's got this persona of Naismith, but, uh, but he's not faking his feelings for her. So he's... No, nor for Tara. Yeah. So he's got a real issue because <laughs> he's losing Naismith. Yeah, the trouble is... Yeah, Ellie Quinn is in love with Admiral Naismith. She has no time for Lord Verkosigan. She's not interested in going to Barrier and being Countess Verkosigan and being stuck on one planet you know, for the rest of her career. She likes what she's doing. Uh, and very wisely, she sticks with that. Um, she would, uh, you know, some people can give it all up for love. You know, Miles' mother did, or appeared to. Although, you know, she was basically out to explore new worlds. Barrier, it's a new world. Let's explore it. Um Quinn, not so much. So, uh, so she would not have been happy as a barrier. So that was kind of a a doomed relationship if he was going to go back and be, if he was going to cut off Naismith and go back and be Vorkus again. Then Quinn was on the wrong side of the line. Now, if he stayed and decided to you know, run away from barrier and just be Naismith, uh, then that relationship could have continued. Uh, so it was uh, one of those. One of those things where nobody's wrong and nobody's evil and nobody's cruel, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work. They had to had to work through that hole. Um, How does the story develop from here? Um, since there are what fourteen books? Yeah, however many. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's kind of a kind of a linchpin and turning point in the series because of Miles' many changes, his career changes, uh, the direction of the series. Uh, goes off more toward mystery stories uh, from here on out because he becomes, in the course of memory, he becomes an imperial auditor, which is kind of a high-level investigator uh, directly under the control of the emperor who can basically you know, send them. He's got a team of nine of them, and he sends out to you know, deal with various problems that come up that are special problems. Uh, so the next book after uh, memory is Kamar, where Miles goes off for his first... Uh, assignment as an imperial auditor, and he's actually accompanying a more senior auditor, uh, Professor Vortice, uh, and they're off to investigate a, uh, what appears to be a space accident uh, on near Kamar of, uh, 
of their Saleta array, which is helping to terraform the planet. And that uh, leads to things, you know, and then we get, you know, a whole, whole mystery plot unravels from there. So that's his first auditorial investigation, uh, in the course of which he meets uh, Ekaterin Borswasson, who is a Vor woman. Um, and uh, then the second of the book that follows immediately from Kumar is a civil campaign, which is Miles's courtship of, uh, of Ekaterin. Uh, which he does in full-on Miles fashion as a as a military campaign, which is so wrong, <laughs> and comes up to bite him in so many amusing ways. Um, so that was uh, there were the kind of it was like uh, Kamar is all every one of these books is transitional. Kamar has two things going on. It's the, the first is first appearance as an auditor, and the first appearance of this romance. It's kind of the uh, the melodramatic half of the romance, and then a civil campaign is the romantic comedy. Uh, and then we go on uh, Diplomatic Immunity, takes place a few years later, and there's another auditorial investigation. Uh, and then Cryoburn is, um, jumps forward several years and is yet another uh, off-planet auditorial investigation. So it gets to do a lot of mysteries uh, in this section of the, of the series. And a lot of people write series in different genres. I keep writing different genres in one series, which... Uh, the fun thing about the the series is is that you never know. You know, it, one will be a mystery, and the next one will be sort of a romantic uh, comedy. Yes, yeah, so and some will, will be. Will it be a crunchy frog or a spring surprise? Who knows? <laughs> Bite in and find out. But it all it, um, it all fits together. It seems to me to like to... memory could be a place to start uh, a really good place. It's right in the middle of of Miles' big transition to go back and forward from. Mm-hmm reading the series. It have started there. Um, every one of my books has, has readers that started there and say they were fine. And then there'll be this crew of you know, older readers who've read more of them and say, no, you can't start there. You have to start here or there or over there. And it's like, no, they all stand alone. Uh, you can read this and then go back and, and pick up the backstory and it'll be just as, uh, got just as much new things to learn, because you know, I don't recap everything. Uh, there will always be new things to learn when you go back that, uh, that you weren't expecting. So the the suspense works in both directions, I guess, from the book, uh, regardless of which direction you go. There's a certain depth of characterization that, you know, that I can imply with a line if, you know, if the Reader has read the prior book in which you know this character was developed, and the new reader won't get that. You know, it will just be like a throwaway line from their point of view. But if they go back and read the prior books and then read the book in question again, they'll get it the next time, and then it will be uh, be re- like reading a whole different book uh, for the price of one. So there you go, bargain. So all right, here's a big finale question: <laughs> What are you working on now? <laughs> Already. Uh, oh, I'm uh, working on getting better from my spine surgery that I had earlier this year. Oh dear. I somehow managed to combine moving house and uh, and uh, issues with my slowly aging and collapsing spine simultaneously, which is not a good combination. Uh, but I've gotten through both now, and things are improving. Uh, doing some reading, uh, getting my place together, and uh, it's Okay. Yeah, writing isn't much happening at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Surgery seems to throw it off. I've had three of them in the last few years that were major. And, uh, it takes it longer than you think for the writing brain to come back online. But that's, you know, uh, there you go. I'm alive. This is good. Yes, it is. <laughs> we like that. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's good. I'd like to do something new, but... The thing about new is you can't anticipate it. You can't say what it is until you're, you know, into it. Um, but uh, but that gripping idea has not yet come to be. Yeah, you know, I keep saying I wasn't going to write the Ivan book, and then the right idea popped up, and suddenly, you know, it was off and running. So, uh, so I never say never, uh, but the book you will get shouldn't be the book you expect. Uh, I like to be able to surprise readers. So we'll see. It's it's hard to tell. I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not making any promises <laughs> at this time. Well, it's a hell of a wonderful series as it is, um, and a you know a milestone in science fiction. Well, thank you. You know, there's 
there's such a thing as going too far as well, you know, what they call jumping the shark in television series, you know, oh, they should have stopped there. But the thing is, if something's successful, no one wants you to stop. Uh, so, uh, so you can only find out if you've got a book too far after you've written it. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. But there's, you know, there's lots of, lots of books out there, ideas. You can make up new universes, uh, new characters. Uh, things that represent you know, where I am now psychologically. Those are, those are always a good uh, good bargaining chip. There's a bias in the book market, I think, for younger protagonists, and I'm kind of interested in the moment in older protagonists, so I'm not sure where that you know, might lead. Uh, nothing, Not to anything really very commercial, but we'll find out. What Looking back on the Vorkoskin series, um, how do you... How do you, how does it sort of present itself in your mind? I mean, you know, readers have their own sort of an inner world built in it. Um, how do you think about the series that you've you've written? Ah, uh, gosh, on what level? There's so many. As a as a created object, it has a good bit of density by now. It occupies a great deal of my brain that you know, could have been being used for something else. Um, so it's, it's there, it's, it's an artifact. Um, it's got, because it's, you know, a large world, it has enormous numbers of possibilities that I've never explored with it. Uh, you know, the, uh, one of the things about the universe is that there are no aliens in it because they have genetic engineering and the idea is that 10,000 years down the timeline, the aliens will all be us, you know, descended from us, you know, all these different races of creatures, people, uh, that have uh, developed through bioengineering. Uh, and that's kind of beyond the reach of the series to explore. It's a very, uh, very anchored series. You know, with this, this one set, a few generations in one part of the galaxy and you know, one set of characters. Um, and there's you know, potentially more out there. Uh, but it has to be... It has to be the right idea. It has to be an idea that speaks to me. And I tend to be more interested in the character, insides of the characters' heads than in these, these broad, uh, sweeping uh, galactic things mm. that science fiction is so noted for. Do you think, do you talk to your characters <laughs> or think about, um, <laughs> think about how they would react to certain situations or are you sort of beyond it now? Uh, I don't think so. I think they they all kind of exist in my head and you know, can pop up uh, variously. Uh, but that's different from actually being put to work to go through a plot mm -hmm. for me, you know, which is a lot more work and a lot more resistant. <laughs> None of us want to work anymore. We all want to be retired. Um, so yeah, they're they're all there. They come up. Uh, you know, I find that I can recall things, uh, even after a long break. Uh, there was a long break between diplomatic community and Cryoburn, and then um, another bit of a break between Cryoburn and um, uh, Captain Vorpetro's Alliance, which is out in paperback this month, actually. Indeed it is. mention that as well. Yeah. Uh, so that, that comes back. But there are other, I've got these other two fantasy series, and then as I say, there's the, uh, the possibility of doing something that nobody's suggested. So. Um, I don't suffer for lack of, you know, it's, it's not like people whose jobs dry up. Uh, I've often wondered, how do you know if a writer is retired? Uh, how, do you, how do you choose? Uh, you can stop selling. That's different. You can uh, drop dead in the middle of your umpteenth book, which is the ones you all hear about because those are the successful writers. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of options at this stage. We will wait. For as long as it takes you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But, uh, but we have these 16 books, and you can go reread them, uh, which is kind of what republishing memory is all about. And there are new readers coming on all the time. I've never encountered them before. I've been rather fascinated by the fact that so many young readers find the series readable, you know, even though some of the books are coming up on 30 years old. And they, you know, they can still relate to them uh, very directly. Uh, yeah, plus then, and then there are the, the close focus issues, which are usually biology and medicine, and that's something that hits everyone's lives. So 
So it works on a lot of different levels simultaneously. I've mentioned this before elsewhere, but when confronted with the modern world, I feel like uh, someone who's been taken into a, a big fancy giant supermarket and told that they have to eat all the food on the shelves. You know, there's just so much knowledge, and my brain is only one brain. So, so it's a little overwhelming. But, you know, it's the future. We wanted to be here, and now here we are. Here we are. We should, uh, look around and enjoy it. Well, look around and enjoy the book Memory, um, which is out in a new beautiful trade paperback reissue. Uh, it's the ninth novel in... Uh, people count them in various ways. It depends on whether they leave books. There's a reason I never numbered my series. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, uh, oh, I have a, on my Goodreads blog, uh, I have a, uh, a little essay called uh, The Chef Recommends, which gives my own reading order uh, suggestions. So, uh, but the, the, basic, uh, the basic rule is jump in, you won't go wrong. Yeah. There's, a, there's a wonderful recap of, of all the books in the series at the, at the end, a kind of glossary of the books of uh, memory that, uh, mm, mm-hmm. that gives you a good... Yeah, there's timelines. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's various ages. Look it up on the internet. You know, everybody's got a different suggestion for what order you should read them in. The only wrong thing to do is not to read them at all. So there you go. We all agree for the, with that. So uh, memory is now out at booksellers everywhere. And Lois, thank you so much for being with us. Hi, you're most welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Now here's part two of the four-part miniseries Presentation of Islands, an adaptation of a novella by Eric Flint and set in the Belisarius universe by Eric Flint and David Drake. We hope you enjoy it. Bain Audio Drama from Bain Books, the heart of science fiction and fantasy. Bain Audio Drama presents Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint, set in the world of the Belisarius series by Eric Flint and David Drake. of Elephonesis, the aide-de-camp and manservant to Calipodius Serenites, a captain in the Roman army of General Belisarius, and a son of the wealthy Serenites clan of Constantinople. Captain Calipodius was blinded by an enemy mortar at the age of 18. He believed his life was over, and so it might have been were it not for General Belisarius. We Romans were at war with the Malwa, a fanatical cult mostly from the Punjabi region, who had been subverted by a malevolent being from the future. That fact didn't matter so much to the captain at present, however. You see, he had recently received word that his wife Anna was on her way to find him at the front. And since they had not parted on the best of terms, he was not at all certain what Anna had in mind. Ah, that's all of them, Brother Ellis. What a pile of idiots we have here. All right. Abdul, do you still have your bottle of Greek fire? Never leave home without it. Good. Now let's burn the bodies. Katomanes, bring me that torch, will you? Here you go, brother. Thanks. Wait. Yes, girl? Should we say something? Say something? It is just... They were living less than an hour ago. And now we are burning them. Silly looking, aren't they? Dead men. It could have been you. They'd have left you for the crows. I know that. Best get used to the sight of death, girl. You'll see plenty more where you're going. And where are we going? Jarex is the next place. I hesitate to call it a town. Very well. <sighs> Help me load this on their boat. If I'm paying you half my coin and jewels, I hope you will at least not object to a bit of heavy lifting. <sighs> <laughs> Do we like her? She's got spirit. And her husband has cash. That he does, brother. That he does. We must 
must have traveled miles, but I can still see the plume of smoke from their burning. Greek fire is a marvelous invention, the Salonitis. No one will care in these parts. It's a common enough sight. I'm not worried about that. So why the frown? Look at us, happy men rowing right back toward the most dangerous place in the world. It's just... he may hate me. I gave him reason enough. Weird world it is. What a woman will go through to find her husband. When I set out, I, I believed I was coming to ask for a divorce. Really? Is that permitted among your sort? It is rare, but yes, it is permitted. You say you believe you are coming for that reason? I don't hate him. This was never about him. It still isn't. Yet you are traveling into the mouth of war to find him. Yes. As you say, a weird world. But one in which a man must still row if he wants to get anywhere. My lord, I have been waiting for three ori for a simple stone And you permit. wait for three more until the magistrate Meanwhile, is ready for you. the rich of Charax buy their way in and go before me. Of course, me. what do you expect? Damn it, woman, make all of our lives easier. Return to your seat and wait to be called, will wait you? Wait to be called, wait to be called, he says. A person could live her life and die waiting to be called around here. I can't. I simply can't. Lady Saranites, if I permit you to continue on this, this headstrong project of yours, it would bring my career to an end. This is from your father, demanding that you be returned to Constantinople under guard. My father has no authority over me. No, he doesn't. But your husband Calipodius does. Without his authorization, I cannot allow you to continue. I see. And I certainly cannot authorize a ship to carry you forward to Barbaricum. But my husband is far up the Indus. A letter will take weeks now that the winter monsoon season has started. <laughs> I see you have become acquainted with the beastly weather in these parts. Barbaricum is the next town with a telegraph. Permission could be obtained within moments from there. I agree. There is no telegraph here, and it will be some time before the new radio system is working. Nevertheless, you must wait here in Charax for an answer. Allow me to go as far as Chabahari. I would at least be in India. And I would not be in your office every day, Magistrate. <sighs> True. But Anna Saranites, he is not likely to agree, you know. He's my husband, not yours. You don't know how he thinks. True enough. Chabahari, Magistrate? And what about you, Isaurian, and these two men? Can I trust you to keep her safe? If it's worth your career, sir, just imagine the price we'd pay. Oh, very well. Chabahari. Fifty for this fine young thing. She'll make an excellent lady's maid. Step up there, girl. Uh, Thirty-five! Come now, I'm sure a gentleman could find something to do with her as well. <laughs> Forty! Figs! Figs! Ripe and juicy figs! Figs for the fine lady from the west? I don't want any figs, Vendor. What I want is to find whoever is in charge of this place. The market, your ladyship? No, the town, Chabahari. <laughs> your guess is as good as mine, lady. Keep a civil tongue, Vendor, or I'll cut it out. Truly, Chabahari didn't exist six months ago. 
But you might try the military hospital. Lots of Roman soldiers there. Bad place, though. Let's go, Illis. You've never seen such a place, girl. You can't imagine how horrible it can be, the suffering. Nothing could be worse than standing around in this heat. You might consider wearing something a little less... Like a decorated gazebo? As you say, girl. But I imagine you'd peel like a grape with your fair skin. My skin will toughen like anyone else's would, Illis. But first things first. Stop biting. You'll shut up if you know what's good for you. I won't let them. I won't let them take the other and leg. And how will you stop them, cripple? Don't worry. The saw gets sharpened at least once a week. <laughs> to hell with you. <laughs> to hell. It is hell, my friend. Angel. Angel. What in God's name? Who are you? I'm looking for whoever is in charge. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I'd answer the lady if I were you. I'm no doctor, but I promise you that I can find the artery in your neck with this sword. Let him go, Illis. As you say. Chief Medical Officer's in the office over there. Drunk as usual. Come on, Illis. Water, Angel, bring us water. God, it smells like... Illis, do they not have bedpans and latrines in this place? Bedpans? I suppose they share one for 40 men. The barrel over there is the latrine. And that... It's the smell of flesh rotting, isn't it? I warned you, girl. This is a Roman hospital. There are regulations. <laughs> regulations? What regulations? Sanitary regulations. Perhaps she is an angel, as the man says. A creature of beauty that has never set its dainty foot on earth. Damn it, there have to be regulations for a hospital. Don't you people read anything besides those damn dispatches? No one does. No soldier, anyway. Have you ever tried to read the official regulation? No, I suppose I haven't. But I have read Lady Macron Boletisa. I know about the new medical knowledge. This place is appalling. And it doesn't have to be this way. Knowing and doing are two different things, oh, girl. Oh, Angel, please touch me. I know you can heal me, please. Hands away, you! No. No, Illis. It won't do any good, my touch. You have to know that. Just a touch. One touch, my angel. Oh, very well. At least I can wipe the sweat from your brow. There. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Katanamis, go and fetch this man some water. Me? Yes, you. And bring... Good God, see if you can find any clean cloth. This man's bandages are crawling with maggots. Yes, lady, I'll get it. We could be stuck in this hellhole of a town for weeks. Are you going to save every one of them, girl? This is what a rear area hospital looks like. There are plenty others like it. Then this is as good a place to start as any. Start? Start what? Do any of you have an objection to working in trade? Objections? We're not senators, girl. Fine. You'll have to work on speculation, though. I'll need the money I have left to pay the others. What others? Speak sense, girl. I believe you call them the muscle. Your ladyship, we are the muscle. Not anymore. You three are now officers in the hospital service. The hospital service? We'll call it Calipodius's wife's service. How about that? Girl, what in hell are you talking about? You'll see. Come on. Let's find that drunken commandant and get started. Calipodius's wife's service. What a mouthful. But that was the name, and the name stuck. The dozen or so walking wounded that Anna recruited in the next hours, the muscle, as Lady Serenites put it, had no trouble believing that Illus was a killiar and Katamanes and Abdul, two tribunes of a new army service they'd never heard of. They believed because they were veterans of war themselves and recognized Illus and the others for what they were. They knew that General Belisarius promoted without regard to station in life, and so the fact that Abdul was a black man did not faze them. And that is how what began as the fancy of an 18-year-old girl on that day, became very real. Oh yes, real enough when the muscle 
beat the first surgeon into a bloody pulp after he refused to follow Anna's directions to boil his instruments after use, and when he made an unhelpful comment about meddling women. The next day, two more surgeons complained to the commandant. That night, Anna allowed her servicemen to beat those surgeons into a still bloodier pulp. <laughs> she may be a new sort of woman, but she was still a Roman noble. All complaints to the commandant ceased thereafter. Neither did the attendants say a word when they were ordered to dig real latrines away from the hospital tents and to help the immobilized soldiers use them whenever they asked. <sighs> yes, the wife's service, born in a charnel house of a hospital in Chabahari. This is quite some message from your wife, Captain Serenites. I know, General. I knew you were married. Now tell me the personal details. General Belisarius, I... Be at ease, young man. I can spare the time for this. In truth, I would enjoy it. War is a means, not an end. It would do my soul good to talk about ends for a while. I really don't know her very well, sir. We'd only been married a short time before I left to join your army. It was... A marriage of convenience. Your wife is from the Melissini family. Yes. Illustrious. But a family that has fallen on hard times financially. Especially after secretly conniving to assassinate the Empress. I didn't know about that. But like my father said, the Melissinis don't have a pot to piss in. Whereas my family, as you know... Immensely wealthy, but a questionable pedigree. Go back three generations, and we're commoners. The Roman aristocracy will overlook a lot if a family is rich. Especially if they turn out a progeny such as you, extremely well-educated. I wonder when dealing with grammar and rhetoric. Yes, I can drop three Homeric and Biblical allusions into every sentence. But you don't do that with your dispatches. I want everyone to be able to understand them. They've made you famous, boy. And justly so. But let's get back to the problem at hand. The Melissini barely escaped with their lives after the assassination plot was thwarted. If they'd covered their tracks a little less carefully, they'd all be dead, including the innocents, such as your Anna. But they did cover their tracks, and now the Empire needs the aristocracy to come together behind the throne. The Melissini bear great weight among the older families. The newer families support the Empress. And well we should. We wouldn't be where we are without her. And this new technology, it has made us all yet another fortune. Exactly. So you see, the match between you and Anna has great political importance. You, Serenites, get ancient blood added to your line, and the Melissini get... I suppose your father quietly provided Anna's dowry and much more? He did. He saved the Melissini from the poorhouse. And how did the Melissini react to all this? Not gracefully. Anna's mother barely tried to disguise her contempt for me and my family. And Anna? Anna was... She was practically raised by the abbess at the Melissini's teaching convent. From what I could tell, she seemed quite pretty. So I was satisfied. I had known since I was a boy that I would be in an arranged marriage. I was seventeen, General. You were a boy, now you are a man. <laughs> Quite a difference a year can make, Captain. Yes, sir. Why is she doing this, Calipodius? She was so angry at me when I told her I was going off to war. It wasn't because she cared about me. In fact, I think she hated me by then. If she hated you, lad... She wouldn't be going to this great length to get to you. What do you want me to do? It's time you put that splendid mind of yours to work on something more important than war. I suggest you think about it. There's a grammar and rhetoric to marriage, too, you know. Should I truly tell her to come here? To this island? To the Iron Triangle? No, no. Commanding her won't work. She'll disobey on principle. Send Dryopis a letter saying your wife has permission to travel wherever she wishes, 
and to make her own decision. And then, Calipodius, you tell her to do whatever she wants. And so I am writing to allow you to... To give you my permission to either come or go... Anna, I hereby... Damn it, Luke. Crumple that up, will you? Right away, sir. Do you have a fresh sheet? Yes, sir. Right. Right. Write this. Do as you will, Anna. For myself... I would like to see you again. Very good, sir. Very good. Orderly, see to this man's bandage, and be sure to use the boiled linen from the sterilization cabinet when you do it. Yes, your ladyship. Right away. Illis, how are the new tents coming? We've got the fabric in. We're waiting on the stakes. I've sent Katomanes and Abdul to find out what the holdup is. <laughs> we should have the stakes very soon, then. And that new set of latrines? The men are digging them right now, 50 paces away from the hospital. Excellent. Excellent. We need more boiling pots. We have instruments and bandages waiting in line as it is. I'll see to it. What else? What else? This arrived, girl. What? What is it? It's a letter. From who? What am I supposed to do with this? Open it. All right. (gasps) It's from him. Is it now? He says... He says... What does he say, girl? He says for me to do what I want. (laughs) A man who knows how to bend to necessity. He says he would like to see me. A husband wants to see his wife. Does it surprise you, girl? Yes. Considering. And what will we do? We? Yes, we, girl. I can leave Zeno in charge here. He's proven himself very able. True enough. Especially after you saved his leg from the saw. We'll... What do you call it? Make him higher in station? Promote him? Yes. We'll make him a tribune. In the wife's service. Do you think anyone will take it seriously, Illis? Are you joking, girl? Everyone here is both terrified and in awe of you. They think you have holy powers. I understand sterilization techniques, that's all. And they don't. I'm afraid you've become the next thing to a saint in these parts. Then we'd better go, hadn't we? Besides, there's a telegraph in Barbaricum. I'll be needing that. All right. Read it to me. Sir, I'd rather not. Maybe you want to take it to your quarters and... Oh, for God's sake, man. Luke, take the telegraph from him and read it to me. Very good, sir. She says, Address medical care and sanitation in next dispatch to the Senate. Stop. Firmly stop. She's right. God, I'm an idiot. We both are. General, how long have you been standing there? Long enough. We've maintained proper medical and sanitation procedures here in the Triangle, sure enough, but... She must have passed through the invasion staging post. Garrison troops, garrison officers with the local butchers as the so-called surgeons. I will write out the orders immediately. Do so. I'll give you some choice words to include. What do you think? Should we resurrect crucifixion? Perhaps we should make the punishment fit the crime. Surgeons who do not boil their instruments will be boiled alive. Officers who do not dig proper latrines will be buried alive. You do have a way with words, lad. Yes, that's the ticket. And that wife of yours, she's quite something, isn't she? You two might be made for one another after all. This has been part two of Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint, set in the world of the Belisarius series by Eric Flint and David Drake, starring Tracy Coppage as Anna and Paul Kilpatrick as Calipodius, 
featuring Lex Wilson as Illus, Jeff Aguiar as Belisarius, Izzy Berger as Sister Catherine, and Rika Daniel as Irina of Persia, with Carter, Paris Battle, Samuel Montgomery Blinn, Gray Reinhardt, PJ Mask, and Koki Daniel. Sound engineers, Barry Jacob and Craig Brandwine. Music by Maddie Karras and Sherry Leone. Adaptation and script by Tony Daniel. Directed by Jerome Davis. Bain Books publisher, Tony Weiskopf. This audio drama is copyright 2014 by Bain Books. Bain Audio Drama from Bain Books. The heart of science fiction and fantasy. For more Bain Audio Drama and great Bain Books, visit Bain.com. We hope you have enjoyed this production. And now here is part 26 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's what's gone before. It's the 1930s in America, but it's an America that has been magically changed. In the 1860s, a handful of people from all walks of life were visited with special magical talents, and each generation more are so affected. These people are called actives. Most actives use their power for good, but some do not. Jake Sullivan is a private eye. He's a former soldier, an ex-con, and an active heavy, the type of active that controls the force of gravity. Jake's been recruited by a mysterious secret organization of actives dedicated to seeing humanity through a possible magic-based apocalypse. They are known as the Grimnor Knights. If the Grimnor are to be believed, the evil forces of magic introduced into the world have reached a peak, and the apocalyptic finale for humanity may be about to begin. Here is Bronson Pinchot with Part 26 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Mar Pacifica, California The Imperium goon was tied to a chair in the center of the empty storage room. As nicely equipped as the family estate was, it had not come with a proper dungeon, so they had to make do. A single naked light bulb hung directly over their prisoner's head. Francis and Delilah were standing back in the shadows, watching. Lance was the most experienced at, well, everything, and was going to do the actual questioning. Francis found himself praying that the man would roll over and talk quickly because he didn't have the stomach for violence. Sure, he'd killed his fair share of evil men. He'd even shot one of this particular fellow's associates in the face with a P-17 Anfield, but pulling the trigger or using his power to bash someone's head in during a battle was different than hurting someone who was completely at your mercy. Remember the Imperium schools, Francis. He curled his hands into fists and steadied himself for whatever would come next. He and his family and other important delegates had been given a guided tour of one of the premier facilities in Tokyo. As many bored young men tended to do, Francis had wandered off the approved path and gotten lost. He'd seen the parts of the school that weren't shown to the outside world, and it had changed him for the rest of his life. Never forget what they did to the children. Anyone who supported the schools deserved whatever they got. Lance limped up to the chair and pulled the burlap sack from their guest's head. He glared at his captors with angry eyes and surely would have started shouting if it wasn't for the fact Delilah had taped his mouth shut. The spell of weakness was drawn on his forehead with ash from the old place, which seemed somehow appropriate. I'm sure you know who we are, Lance said with his rough drawl. He produced a hunting knife from behind his back and quickly shoved it through the man's shirt. He twitched and jerked away in sudden fear. The blade was so razor-sharp that it sheared through the cloth like it was nothing. 
and Lance laid the man's chest bare. A series of red scratches had been cut into the prisoner's chest. Francis couldn't read the Japanese version of spells, but he'd seen this one before and knew that it granted increased vitality. It made the Imperium thugs harder to put down unless you got them right in the heart or the brain. And I sure as hell know who you work for. Lance made a show of studying the marks. I'm going to ask you some questions. You're going to answer or you're going to regret it. Lance roughly pulled the pressure tape from the prisoner's mouth. He screamed as the tape removed most of his mustache. Grimmy bastards. So, you do know who I am. What's your name? Albert, he spat. Albert Rizzo. Where are you from, Albert Rizzo? Montauk, New York. It never ceased to amaze Francis that Americans would join the Imperium cause, but from what he understood from the International Society, it was the same in every nation. The Imperium recruited mostly from the poor classes. They usually picked normals, gave them a taste of having their own magic, and put them to work. The smartest and most brutal were able to rise in the ranks, and the rest turned into cannon fodder in their never-ending war against the Grim Noir. Who do you answer to, Al? I answer to the chairman. Lance sighed and stabbed the knife into Albert's arm. The man screamed. You know what I mean. The knife came out, the last inch dripping blood. Unfortunately for you, your recruiter marked you with the kanji for health, which means that I can cut on you for twice as long as a regular man for you croak. Plus, I know all the places that hurt, but don't have any arterial bleeding. See where I'm going with this? Albert growled at him. Maddie. He said his name was Mr. Maddie. Francis twitched. He'd heard that name before. The man was a legend even by Iron Guard standards. Big fella, got one bad eye? Lance asked. Yeah, that's him. Wait! Francis jerked toward the female cry. Faye, what's she doing in here? She must have followed them down, but he hadn't heard her. She can teleport, idiot. The girl walked into the circle of light and right up to the chair. Lance raised his hand that wasn't holding a giant knife. You don't want to see this, kid, he said gently. This ain't for you. Where's the one-eyed man? Faye shouted. Go to hell. Lance turned around and stabbed him in the thigh. Albert squealed. See? Look what you made me do. My daddy fought Apaches, and he taught me every damn thing he learned from them when I was little, so don't make me take a trip down memory lane and answer the damn question. I don't know. Albert said. We work in little groups. They, they call us cells. They send telegrams when they need us for jobs. We don't know how to reach nobody else, especially the bosses, I swear. That crazy brunette done killed everybody else in my cell. Lance wiped his knife on Albert's shirt before returning it to the sheath on his belt. See, that wasn't so hard now, was it? I didn't even have to skin you or nothing. Albert started to cry. You don't get it, Grimmy. It don't matter what you do to me. My brothers are going to win in the end. The chairman's way is the only way. We need his leadership. Freedom is a lie. People are starving. There ain't no jobs. The rich keep getting richer while we're dying. The chairman can fix everything. He's just like Jesus. Lance rolled his eyes. Damn useful idiots. No, He's not just magic. He works miracles. He's the real second coming. He's the new messiah. Only this time he's making the weak into the strong. His plan is to make man better, the perfection of humanity. People like you say that he's taking away freedom, but he's really just protecting us from our own bad choices. The chairman will save us all. When he's done, everyone will have power. This isn't just a movement. This is true religion. I see that look on your face. You think we're crazy. Oh, you think you can stop us, but you're wrong. I've seen Maddie kill your stupid kind like it was nothing. You think you're so powerful, you ain't got nothing. Faye began to shake, but Francis didn't think that it was because of what Lance had done. 
Were you with the one-eyed man in El Nido? Is that where that old Mexican lived with his stupid brat and his stupid cows? Yeah, his magic was supposed to be so rare and special and shit, but it was nothing compared to... Albert's eyes widened, and he looked down in shock at the knife planted squarely in the center of his chest. Francis jerked in surprise. Faye had traveled directly behind Lance. She slowly took her hand away from the quivering knife. He was Portuguese, and cows aren't stupid, she shouted. Albert tried to say something, but then his head rolled forward limp. When Francis blinked again, Faye was gone. Ah, hell, Lance said, reaching around and realizing that Faye had relieved him of his hunting knife. That ain't good. A single kanji won't save you from getting knifed in the heart. Faye, Francis shouted, realizing what had just happened. He ran for the stairs. Delilah stepped into the light, grabbed the Imperium man by the hair, and lifted his head. He was obviously dead. You know, I like her. She's a firecracker. Faye's boots landed in the soft grass of the front lawn. Taking a few steps, she folded her arms around her chest and sunk down to her knees, sobbing. That's another promise broken. I said no more crying. She was supposed to be tough now. She'd just killed one of the men who'd killed Grandpa. He deserved it. He deserved to die just as much as the one she'd gotten with a pitchfork. She'd taken Lance's knife and she'd driven it right between his ribs and into his heart and killed him dead as meat. It served him right. Then why am I so sad? Her whole life had been hard. It never let up. She tried not to think about her first family. She had been routinely beaten for her weird gray eyes, just for being different, and her father had beaten her mother occasionally for spawning a demon. They'd kept her around, though, because somebody who could steal food so good was okay, even if she'd been sired by the devil. And even then she'd been happy. If everything was miserable, then as a little girl she'd decided that she'd be happy, just to spite them. Once she'd made that decision, nothing else mattered. She made up her own world in her head, one that wasn't filled with hunger and terror, and she lived there instead. And then one day she found out that there was a place in the real world that was every bit as good as the fake one. And then she wasn't alone anymore. The one-eyed man had taken that away from her. That's why she was crying, she decided. It wasn't about the fact she'd just put a knife into a man's chest. It was because he wasn't the right man. Faye. She turned to see Francis running from the house. Oh, no. She didn't want him to see her like this. She sent her thoughts ahead. Are you? She landed on her knees at the top of a rock cliff, looking down into the crashing waves far below. Grandpa had told her about crossing an ocean like this crammed into a tiny room on a steamship. He told her all sorts of stories about working hard, fishing, cutting up whales, about his first few cows, but he'd never bothered to teach her about any of this grim noir stuff. Oh, Grandpa, you were probably scared to tell me. You knew about people like the one-eyed man, but I could have handled it. I'll sure handle it now. You taught me a lot, and one of those things was to always finish any chore I start, she told the ocean. I promise. A seagull landed on the rocks next to her. Who are you talking to? Lance asked. His deep voice seemed strange coming from the goofy white bird. None of your business, she snapped. Sounded like you were talking to the dead. The seagull waddled up to the edge and looked over. You gonna jump? Face snorted. That's stupid. Damn right it is. You know, nobody blames you for doing that, though next time ask me before you swipe my knife, I'm particular like that. She wiped her eyes. Sorry. If we had to apologize to everybody every time we screwed up around here, we sure wouldn't get much done. How old are you, anyway? I don't know, she answered truthfully. My first family said I didn't deserve no birthdays because I was the devil's child. Squawk. What? That's a bunch of bunk. I figure I'm maybe 16 or 17, give or take. 
The gull clucked. Damn, that makes me feel old. Well, for what you've been through, you're doing just fine for your age. You ain't the first person around this place that's got a need for revenge. Do you need any revenge? Well, he seemed hesitant. The chairman destroyed everyone I loved and took my whole life away and part of my leg. What do you think? I think I liked you better as a squirrel. Lance flapped his wings indignantly. That's not what I meant. You're a strange kid, but I do agree. I've got a belly full of garbage and I smell like shit. You want to come back to the house? Francis is running around like a chicken with his head cut off looking for you. I think he's worried. Oh, he seems really nice. He's a good enough kid, but he's had a sheltered life compared to people like us, so don't hold that against him. He means well. He's nice looking. Oh, my hell. Lance shook his narrow beak back and forth. That boy's been around the block, more than a few blocks, I might add, and he's at least four years older than you. Plus, I don't want to have to snap his little twig neck for dishonoring you, okay? Let's keep our minds on business for right now. Remember Evil Empire trying to get a super weapon? I won't help stop them, and I'm going to kill the one-eyed man myself. I swear it. Lance was quiet for a long time, his head automatically cocking from side to side as he stared out to sea. He's in the big leagues, kid. You might as well say you're going to kill the chairman while you're at it. He's the one-eyed man's boss? Fine. I swear I'll kill him too, then. Lance sighed. You're really good at the other magic, aren't you? Faye asked. You've got your animal power, but you can write spells, too. If you taught me what you know, then I could be more help. It ain't easy, he said, and it's more than spells. Being grim noir means that you hold the line. It's learning how to fight, how to tail somebody and be a good spy, how to shoot. All the tricks of the trade. It takes a lot of practice and hard work. Well, if this chairman is as tough as everybody says he is, we better get started if I'm going to kill him any time soon. The seagull laughed. Delilah's right. You are a firecracker. All right, I'll teach you how to be a grim noir knight, but on one condition. No more murdering unless I say so, or you got a real good reason. That was part 26 of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pinchot. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz and a menagerie of butterbugs producing delicacies of delight and an Imperial Security Service tacit but galaxy-spanning salute of gratitude to Lois McMaster Bujold, author of Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance, Memory, and creator of the Miles Forkosigan saga. Thanks so much also to the cast and crew of Islands as well. We'll have part three next time on the podcast. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Bye.